Welcome to the Global Marketing Show, the podcast for all things international business. I'm your host, Wendy Pease, president of Rapport International and a translation expert. Come along with me today as we talk to an expert in the global marketing world about facing their biggest fears, hearing about mistakes they made or saw, discussing best practices, and sharing fun travel language and culture story. Hello and welcome to the Global Marketing Show. So have you heard of Pepsi? Of course you have. Everybody knows Pepsi. Today I get to welcome John Jove. He is VP and General Manager of PepsiCo International Sales. So I know he's going to have some awesome stories. He has been with PepsiCo for 27 years. He's been a Senior Director of International Retail Sales um, and he's lived and done work all over the world. Um, He's also really highly educated. He has a BA in international studies from John Hopkins, a master's in international economics from Columbia University, and an MBA in general management from the Tuck School of Business, my alma mater. So we didn't overlap, but we shared a lot of the same experiences. So welcome, John. Thank you, Wendy. It's great to be with you. Yes, I'm, I'm so excited to hear about your experiences. But, I, you know, I got to ask, what's your favorite PepsiCo product? Oh, I love them all. But I have to say that the reason why I joined PepsiCo was because I, from a young age, I always enjoyed drinking Pepsi. And it's a bit sweeter uh, than perhaps the competition. And uh, also, uh, I love Lay's potato chips. So that was the initial <laughs> hook. <laughs> and then over time, as we bought more brands uh, like Tropicana and Gatorade and Quaker Oats and things you wouldn't associate with PepsiCo, I love those too. I highly recommend the Quaker each morning. So <laughs> Quaker Quake, Oats. Quaker, Quaker Oats. Oats each yeah. morning. Yes. Each morning. We have it in instant. We have it in classic. We have it in all types of variations. Yeah, and see if you eat your oatmeal in the morning, then you can have your Pepsi and your Lay's later on, right? Because you've cleaned out your arteries. (laughs) We've covered you the entire day from morning till night. I love it. I love it. Yeah, I um, I think Quaker now does a Quaker Oats now does a gluten free oats too, right? Yeah, gluten free, lower sugar, protein added. Uh, There's so many variations that are exciting to check out at Quaker.com and. Each of our brands have their own sites, so you can learn more. For example, Gatorade's really been transformed. Uh, you can do, you know, Gatorade in in, uh, in G zero. In other words, Gatorade without sugar. Oh, um, nice! Yeah, there's so many different variations of products these days. It's exploded, and uh, and our latest new product, which I'm happy to <laughs> share with you, is going to be. Uh, Mountain Dew with a slight kick of alcohol. So you can look for that in your stores coming up. And I think in Q4, in Q4 in the fall of this year. No way. Mountain Dew with alcohol. What kind of alcohol is going in it? Uh, It's going to be a, I believe it's a grain-based alcohol, but basically it's, you know, it's addressing the growing adult beverage segment. And uh, so that's a new way to drink your favorite Favorite soda. <laughs> you don't need to mix it anymore. You could just yeah. buy it pre mix Yeah, I mean, that's a really popular thing right now to get your alcohol and your caffeine in there together. Exactly. That's exactly yeah. it. Huh. Well, good for Mountain Dew. So we're talking about the little changes, you know, like Quaker Oats is adapting and Mountain Dew now adding alcohol. But what I'd love to get into is the product mix across the countries, because I've heard that Americans have a very sweet tooth, whereas in in some countries it's not as much, in other countries it's more. So how, how do you modify products for international well, I mean, every product has its own. First of all, we do deep consumer insight. That's that's the foundation for all the brands. And I think that's one of PepsiCo's really big competitive strengths is understanding consumer, um, as you would expect from a consumer product goods company. But um, And so that leads to a lot of variation, not so much in Pepsi as you would think. Uh, Pepsi, for example, is well suited to a lot of the emerging markets that tend to prefer a sweeter taste. Um, but that's more of a standard formula. Uh, you know, the, 
the variation you probably see more of is in the snacking side of the business. Um, you know, where we will obviously adapt, you know, the core is still a potato chip mm -hmm. in various forms and various cuts. It could be thinner, it could be thicker, it could be like a ruffle product with waves, but then you're going to adapt it with flavors and seasonings. So for example, in China, uh, the Chinese prefer to have a hotter, spicier chip in the winter to warm your body. Hmm. Um, and then a cooler flavors, which tend to be more fruit flavors on a potato chip uh, in the summer to cool your body. So that's just an example. Um, another one is in Mexico where we're coming up with something called Sabores de Mexico or flavors of Mexico, which are keying off different regions, for example, Oaxaca in the South, uh, the flavors that are kind of dominant in that area and that have really broad national appeal. So you, you, you're definitely going to see more of things like, you know, trying to appeal to um, regional flavors and uh, distinct consumer preferences across the entire portfolio. Less so in things like Gatorade that have more of a functional benefit, of course, but certainly in the snacking space uh, would be one, uh, one, key, one, key, one key opportunity or growth that opportunity for us. Yeah, so that's interesting. So you take the potato and you modify the flavor um, to go across the world rather than finding different things. Like if I look at some of the Indian snack foods, they've got like a puffed rice with uh, yeah. like a chili powder on it, which exactly. I don't see here in the United States. I have to go to an Indian store to find it. Yeah, and they, you will find them there, by the way. So that's a good good thing you do. Um you know, and it's, it, it varies. Again, South Africa, we have local variants. And in the UK, we had a big program around, you know, uh, popular restaurants and popular chefs. And we did that in Central America. So these ideas are ricocheting around the world, but they all key on what the consumers look for, either in the cuisine or in popular chefs or in popular restaurants. So you have, okay, so you'd really look at what are people eating, what are the chefs doing, what are the tastes that you put together and you keep it regionally. Do you ever bring like the South African flavors into the United States or the UK or other countries? You will see in the UK, for example, which is a big snack market for us, we, we brought in uh, some Asian flavors into that market because the consumer base in the UK, as you know, tends to be really quite interested in kind of world flavor profiles. Um, in the US, you'll see um, a, a more of a focus on Hispanic flavors, obviously because of the large Hispanic demographic. So, you know, you're playing to your demographic and to what the market is looking for. Now in Canada, um, there's a big Indian, um, you know, uh, community. Uh, and so we tend to develop, uh, we've actually adapted and brought over some of our uh, Indian snacks into the Canadian market, more into Eastern Canada. And then in the Western Canadian market, which tends to be more linked to Asia, uh, more focus on, you know, Asian uh, flavors. So everywhere you're gonna see us do things differently depending upon consumer preference and what we see as a growth opportunity. That's really interesting. So it's not even just by country, but you're, deep diving in by region yeah. as to who's getting what yeah. products. And, and, and the future, if you think about digital, the future is personalization. So if I know that you live in Boston or you, you, know, you, you like um, Indian snacks, for example, and you've been going to Indian ethnic stores or you follow things on Facebook that you know, are aligned to that, we could perhaps uh, think about sending you a digital message whenever you're logging in to buy snacks or buy foods, um, a display ad that would say, you know, have you considered, you know, these Indian snacks that are available locally or online? Um, so that's just an example of what could be coming. I mean, the holy grail is personalization. Okay. Right, right. Right. And so you've got to figure out, like, how is there a way that you could figure out that I've gone to the Indian store in Waltham and bought those snacks? Or how would you track that down? Uh, there's a number of ways to do it. I, I you know, 
not being a, a digital native myself because I'm not of the generation. <laughs> However, that said, I am trained <laughs> in I, I Google Analytics <laughs> and other tools. Uh, I've had to, this dinosaur has had to train himself on how to yeah. the digital generation. But essentially, you begin to the path to purchase for consumers across all categories has changed, right? We, you'll get on Google, you'll look for Indian snacks, and then um, that will trigger, that could trigger an ad to be to be shown to you by Google, which is Google, of course, is predominantly an advertising company if you look at their revenue base. So, you know, that's how you would do it. And then of course with Facebook, you might, you know, you might like Indian music or Indian culture or Indian food. Um, so there's all types of ways to get to know consumers, uh, all within the bounds, of course, of, you know, national data privacy regulations right. and things like that, because in the, you, you know, in the European is GDPR, there's different right. digital rules that, you know, we follow, of course, in every country. So, but it's all about trying to understand your consumer, however you do it, um, and trying to address their needs. And so how, how do you do it? Is the research to understand the consumer different across countries or markets? You know, the, the research is, the methodologies, I think, are, are similar, right? The methodologies tend to be, you know, initially qualitative, develop hypothesis, and then you validate through quantitative testing. Um, but essentially, the tools and techniques are, are, are quite similar. The art is, I mean, it's a bit of art and science, as you say. I mean, right. I mean science is, you've got the tools to do it. The art is okay. How do you interpret that? You know, it's kind of what is the trend? You know, so what? What does that? What does that really mean? What does it matter? And then now what? Now what do I do? So we we tend to look at in those three steps. You know, what's going on? So what? And then you know now what? Um, and that's a useful framework for your listeners and for people to follow. Uh, to really get to an actionable, take an insight that you developed and then work it through your business process to come up with a solution to a problem or an opportunity that a consumer is uh, you know, facing. Okay, so you're a huge global company and you've got departments that are doing this. So if we're talking to companies that are a little smaller and they, you know, they've got a hypothesis and they're testing and solution and they're getting into global markets, I mean, you could do focus groups. You could look at the number of new restaurants. You could look at, you know, competitor products. So you could do, there's so many different ways to research that. How would you, how are you doing it? And how are you seeing some of the smaller companies do it? Or would you imagine? I think there's, there's, there's probably a couple of different answers to that. For big companies like PepsiCo, Procter & Gamble, you know, multinational companies, global companies, you know, we have operations on the ground. So mm -hmm. we have consumer insights people who are looking at these things all the time. Of course, there are agencies that are out there um, a few that are very good include Euromonitor that are global. Obviously, Nielsen has a very big global footprint. Um, and so you can, what we tend to do is we rely upon our teams to come up with, you know, what's right for your market. Um, now, for smaller companies, small to mid-sized enterprises, an interesting way to do this uh, is to look at what's what are popular search words in a category in the country. So you can get on Google and look at the other analytics platforms and seeing what are people searching for? I mean, this is actually a great way to even um, launch a new product in a country is what what are what are the top trending things in a category, um, whether it's clothing, music or whatever it might be. Uh, that's one thing I highly recommend. Obviously, going to the country uh, at some point, I think, is fundamental. Um, and and then if for a small enterprise or medium enterprise, they want to have local partners, that that probably is in that middle box. In other words, if you don't have a local local subsidiary, a local operation, then maybe you have an importer, distributor, or somebody you're working with in that country that can help you decode insights. And typically those companies, you know, just talking to their staff will give you a deep insight. Um, 
And then other things can be done like organizing focus group panels online. All these things have to be done in what we call agile ways now, which is just using technology like Zoom, for example, or Ring Central or Microsoft Teams to basically engage people in discussion in a focus group. You can have as many people as you want on a focus group, um, giving you ideas and, and, and really, and that's probably a step that many people miss is getting that consumer insight. It takes a lot of work. And I always think of the five whys. I mean, it takes five questions on why before you get to the fundamental. <laughs> oh, interesting. Give an example of that, because I think I know uh, where you're going with that, but let's... Uh, I don't have a concrete example, but I just, I just, I use it often. I mean, maybe I'll get to, you know, why aren't they buying the product? You know, the, well, they don't, maybe they don't like um, the package size. Well, why don't they like the package size? Well, because they are uh, trying to address a new occasion that's emerged out of the pandemic. Okay, what occasion are they trying to address? Well, we're trying to address, you know, early evening wind down with the family. Okay, well then what are they looking for in that? So you just keep going down that path. And, but not many people do it. The, the secret is, I think, is in the questioning and listening and, you know, taking those notes and then sharing that internally across different functions and trying to understand. So, you know, that's a difficult thing. It's probably, you know, I think of people who did uh, ethnography in college or, you know, or, you know, sociology, which is often uh, not highly valued. I think, you know, you begin to understand uh, societies and having people who have that sociology background or cultural ethnography or uh, things like that, I think are incredibly helpful. Right. So we got a call last week um, from a research company that wants to hold focus groups and they want the client company who's all English speaking be able to understand the responses from the people in uh, a Spanish speaking country. And so we, you know, I talked to him about having interpreters on the line. So when you're doing in-country focus groups, how do you handle some of the language issues? Well, we have people there who, who manage that. So for example, in Brazil, the Brazilian PepsiCo Brazil would manage that locally. So they would ask the questions and then you know, we typically would actually many times we'd use agencies for that work. And of course, they're all native speakers. But that's not possible because the agencies obviously, um, you know, cost cost quite a bit and they require a certain scale size business to pay for that. So doing what you're talking about and having a live interpreter, I think, is very valuable. Uh, you know, I think the services that you offer, I think, are very valuable because you can't rely upon online translation tools. I mean, they just don't give the richness, the color, the context. And, you know, I, I lived in Brazil and, and you know, Brazilian Portuguese is different from Portuguese in Europe, I mean, in, in Portugal. So, I mean, and you have to pick up those, those, those differences. And a lot of it is based on history and culture and relevant than ever right now. Right, right. It's so true. Unless you've had somebody that's lived internationally or speaks two languages, they can't understand that yeah. richness. And so it's really good to hear you talking about that. So Brazil, you lived in Brazil. We can't, we can't jump over right that. We got to come back and visit that. So what were you doing in Brazil? I was actually working for PepsiCo Foods Brazil, which is basically the Frito-Lay of Brazil. And so I was managing uh, kind of the south region of Brazil, one of the three most popular states around Sao Paulo and then south from there, Santa Catarina and uh, Paraná and the Rio Grande do Sul, which is just on the border of Argentina. And uh, it, it's a very industrialized part of, of Brazil. Many Italians live, you know, came over to Brazil, lived in Sao Paulo. The Germans went to kind of Santa Catarina, uh, which is a bit further south, and then Rio Grande do Sul, which is on the border of Argentina. You have a, a Portuñol, you know, a mixture of Spanish and Portuguese, which I always mm. found kind of interesting. You know, you think in your mind, does the frontier mark, when do I start speaking a new language? 
And, you know, you start to see in some of these countries, there's a blurring of languages. So I have never heard that before. Portanol. I've heard of Spanglish. Portanol. Portanol, Portuguese and Espanol. That's fantastic. Espanol, the two together. Yeah. Portanol. That takes a certain, that took me a while to start speaking. <laughs> <laughs> Because <laughs> I should say my family's from Spain originally, from Barcelona. My wife is from Italy. So we tend to speak, and we ended up speaking Brazilian Portuguese. So we have a mixture of three or four languages, and we're always mixing words. So I can't even think of what our variation is, but it's kind of Portanol, Italo, Portanol. <laughs> 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 With a smattering of English thrown in. <laughs> so what was your native language growing up? It was English, but my, but my parents actually from Barcelona. Um, and they're so, I mean, the primary language for Spanish was their national language living in Spain. Then they immigrated to the U.S. And um, when we got to the U.S., it was the 1960s. And my parents said, you know what? We're living here now. We don't want you to speak you know, Spanish want you to speak English. So I had to learn, ironically, I had to learn Spanish later on. Yeah. Um, but I have enough of a musical ear to pick it up. <laughs> that is, uh, it's such a difference from people now because people are keeping their language. But back in the 60s, 70s, and before that, people came in and they said, you know, we want to get rid of it and we want, you know, we want the melting pot. You're right, you're right. But, and uh, so with my son, um, he his first language is Italian. So even though okay. we were living here, of course, my wife was spending all her time with him and he was, you know, his first language was Italian. And then we had to get him off that and into English. So it was quite interesting. So and now he's correcting my Italian. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So you were speaking Italian with your wife at home so he could yeah. learn it? Uh, she was speaking to him in Italian as she was raising him and, and, you know, early years. And then we had our grandmother, her mother visiting and you know, it was an Italian ecosystem of food and language and music and culture. And of course, everyone loves Italy. And so he grew to love, you know, Italian culture. And uh, I just make sure we divide our time between Italy and Spain, just to keep a little <laughs> bit of that Spanish Catalan heritage that's so important. Right, right. It definitely is. I see. So while she was raising him, she was speaking Italian, and then you were still speaking English or Spanish to him in the house when he was young? More English than anything else, because, okay. uh, yeah, no, I mean, I think, uh, so that was, it was, it was fun times. I mean, we traveled a lot internationally as a family, and so we did a lot together on those trips, and I always tried to give him cultural indoctrination of wherever we went give them a cultural tour. Yes. It was never sit on the beach type vacations. It was always, you know, what can we learn here on this trip? Oh, I love it. That's what I did with my kids too. And so they've oh. been <laughs> all over the place. Our last trip before the world shut down was to India. So. <laughs> oh my God, you see? There you go. That's why you like Indian snacks. Now I know oh, why. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You probably well, have an Indian, you know, and it's, it's pro and people can see that you're searching, for example, on TripAdvisor for Indian hotels. So begin to see that you have an affinity for Indian, you know, cuisine, perhaps, or you know, culture. Well, it was with a friend. It was with the African Methodist Episcopal Church uh, outreach people, person, people to people outreach. And I went with a friend of mine, and um, we were the only whites on the trip, and my kids were the only boys and the only <laughs> kids. <laughs> so they they had full cultural immersion every which way, and and they were fine with it. I mean, we have a nice mix of of people who are friends and they like different cultures and they had a lot of aunties by the end <laughs> <laughs> aunties, that's funny uh -huh. that's... so it was fabulous but it was definitely a learning i mean um we got to go to a dalit or an untouchable village and we had all sorts of real life experiences there not not the sit on the beach or the yeah. shellac version so They'll never forget that. And that's the gift I think we give our kids. I mean, ultimately, I, you know, I felt we were going a lot to, you know, we did a lot in Europe because of our families from there. Right. But I had it in my agenda that just before COVID to start pivoting towards, you know, India to, 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 to you know, to South Africa, perhaps to go down to Latin America with him. But then COVID hit and everything. Uh, so it's a that's a project yet to be completed. 
Right, right. Well, my kids have the bug, so I've, I've, I've taught them and they'll continue on. <laughs> so, okay, so you move, how old were you when you moved over here to the United States? Well, I was born, I'm the only one in my family of five to be born in the U.S. Everyone else is born either in South America or in Spain. My sister was born in Argentina because my parents were living there. But um, yeah, so I'm the only one born here. And then mm -hmm. we established, we kept close links. I was going back every summer to Spain, you know, staying with family and friends. And so did you ever have, I, I mean, so you grew up multicultural and yeah. traveling. Did you, when was the first time you remember having a culture shock? I don't think I, you know, I've been traveling for so many years in so many places. I, you know, I guess Egypt probably was, I, I mean, I, I have to probably split between India and, and Egypt. I mean, Egypt, of course, was a new, culture in a sense and it was a you know it's uh, a muslim based society and uh i think that may have even been before the revolution there um but it was definitely a different type of experience also in terms of geography the desert and so forth so that was a bit of a of a new experience i would say the other one was india um just because there's so many indias in india you know, and I had not really had much experience in that part of the world. I knew a bit of Latin America and, and pretty widely traveled across the region and then also Europe, uh, west to east, but never really India. And for that matter, China. I mean, China, again, the many Chinas of China, and that carries over into language as well. And, and same thing in India, you know, the many dialects of India. And so dig into that a little bit more when you say so many Indias in India or so many Chinas in China, what do you, would you explain that more? Well, it, it's really everything from the history uh, of, and that's something that I really try, I really recommend to your audience as well. I, I try to read history a lot of the countries I'm dealing with and try to pick up a few words here and there, you know, that if I can, um, to build bridges to people. And and so as I started reading about India, I mean, you could see that India, you know, obviously, you know, the, just the, the migration of people over the centuries and then, you know, the European colonial presence and like, so over in Goa, very unusual that in Goa, you have got this Portuguese influence. I mean, who would have thought but because the Portuguese were there um, or in Macau, the same thing. I went to Macau a couple of years ago and I was like, wow, it feels like I'm in something like south of Lisbon. And, and, you know, so, you know, that's an example of, and that's a colonial example, I would say, but within the culture themselves, I mean, within China, certainly the way you do business in Beijing or Shanghai or in, you know, Guangzhou in the south, it's all very different. It's all very different. And it's, you know, you could put your finger on, on, you know, on culture, on geography, history, you know, Guangzhou tends to be very entrepreneurial because that's where, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom kind of emerge there. Um, and then Shanghai tends to be very, you know, business, global business center. And, you know, uh, and then of course, Beijing is a seat of the government. So that tends to be more, uh, you know, politically focused. Um, and so everything you do has to be done with an understanding of where am I going? What's important to these people? And, and nowadays, before you had to do a lot of research, I call desk book research, you know, which I used to travel with 10 books. And my wife would be like, why is that suitcase so big? I got 10 books in there. <laughs> so <laughs> nowadays you just bring your iPad and I use Audible and I listen to stuff all the time. And there's just, there's no reason for people in international business to not go onto Google and search articles related to a certain topic. You know, I'm going to Shanghai, what's happening in Shanghai? You know, what's, what are the big things, the big trends and, or I'm going to, you know, to Delhi or wherever it might be. And, and I think, you know, you obviously have to know what's going on because of COVID, but you also have to know other factors that, that could be emerging uh, that will impact your business. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think that's really good advice is is just do a little research, culture, geography and history. And it's so true, because if you think about those three places in China that you talked about coming into the US, it would be the same thing. Know that DC is government and it's going to be focused yeah. on that. You know, New York is the big financial center. And so it is, it's not just the United States, just like it's not just China. Yeah, and that's exactly right. I mean, it's a. Fe- I mean, U.S. is a federated system. So, and, and obviously, we see nowadays this. The, you know, the states all have their own distinct views. Um, but you know that happens also in Mexico and in Brazil. Brazil's a federated system as well. Um, so you do have to take into account these differences, and there's just pockets of opportunity and pockets of risk. Mm-hmm. And that's probably two dimensions to look at opportunity and risk. You know, what can I do for business and what risk do I have to mitigate? And that's more important than ever. So you have, how many countries do you think you've been to? Uh, you know, I never really counted, but I think it's at least, I, I guess it's at least 60 or 70 countries. So I'm, I still got a ways to go. <laughs> <laughs> Well, last I checked, there was 198, but there, yeah, there so a long to, way to go. Some goal of like hitting a hundred. I think it's the Century Club or something like that. But yeah. yeah, most people have not been to 60 or 70 countries, and you've been quite successful in business for a global company. And early on, you learn to get a to get along across cultures, but. Even you had culture shock going to some places. So what are some of the tricks that you use after you research a country and when you land there, when you're dealing with people across language and culture? You know, one of the, a few interesting things. Number one, um, I try to prep myself, as you say, before I go. And that includes, I might even download a book on Audible, listen to it in the flight. Mm-hmm. Um, then when I land on the ground, I start, I start picking up local newspapers, you know, to a certain degree, English versions of them, the South China News in Hong Kong or something like that. Every country you go to has some local English version you can read. Then I think I start, I just ask people, you know, ask colleagues, what's going on? What's important to you? And I try to cut it by segment, you know, either by geographic or demographic. What are young people in China thinking about these days? Questioning, I must say, is one of my strengths. And that's something I highly recommend. I also think I have a very good, let's call it a musical ear for languages. And so I try to understand how, do, how are people speaking English in these countries? And that's very interesting because I begin to understand how they think that way. And also I try to mimic the words they're using. So I'm not gonna use some big word if they use a smaller version of it. And and, by, and I find myself after a while, if I was to listen back to my conversation, I almost sound a bit like them. So in India, I'll begin speaking English like they speak in India. I'll start doing the same thing in China. In Brazil, I'll use like a nasal. I'll start talking like them, mixing in a few words I may know. Um, I may be adopting even the mannerisms, how they move their hands and other you know, ways of, you know, Give, you know, having that type of, you know, understanding that I understand what you're saying, nodding the head or, you know, and you have to be careful because some cultures nodding the head means, no, I don't agree. In other countries, <laughs> shaking the head means, yes, I agree. So you have to be careful how you interpret the signals. But that's really important. Try to, this is one simple thing. Try to speak like people are speaking. And I even do that in the South. If I travel in the South, in the U.S., wherever I go, West Coast, I try to begin to use words they use. And it's funny because after a while, people are like, I don't know where you're from. <laughs> <laughs> that is so true. It's so true. And I, I can remember, you know, I lived internationally when I was young. And so I had to learn some of these tricks. But I, I didn't realize them until you started t- talking about yeah. them. But I was a lifeguard down in Louisiana one summer when my parents had moved down there when I was in college. And the kids didn't understand me. They'd look at me and they'd say, ma'am, you know, so I started picking up all y'all stop that, you know, like the other guards, just because I got so tired of being 
not understood. Right. So it's not a mimicking. It's not a copying. It's not a making fun of. It's really just trying to yeah, connect. Adapting. Right. Adapting. adapting. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And the questioning, um, I've heard other people saying, you just stay curious. And stay so curious. That's, it, that's the secret. You, that's know, you the have secret. to be, and I would say hyper curious. I think that's the, that's the thing. Um, and, and intentionally curious. In other words, I can be curious about, you know, what's going on in that country, but hype, you know, intentionally curious is, you know, what are the kinds of questions I want to understand and thinking about that in advance and thinking about it through different lenses. Again, geographic, demographic, you know, those are probably the two big dimensions to consider in a business, but um, you can do psychographic, you know, there's all kinds of ways to cut, you know, consumer insights. Right, right. Yeah, that's so I like that putting on different lenses. So you've got a lot of tricks and a lot of successes, but I'm sure you had some things that went wrong along the way. Can you share a story or two about mistakes that you had made personally or that, you know, you saw the company make? You know, I think, you know, when I first went to Latin America, um, to Brazil, you know, we were undergoing some transformation and how we distribute products and things like that. Um, typically, you associate Frito-Lay with these trucks that go up and down the street. And we were looking at new ways of what we call going to market. And, and so we, we uh, you know, I think the challenge that I faced was, OK, how do we do this in a more efficient way, more effective way? And I was thinking along the efficiency paradigm or dimension, which tends to be a very US-centric mindset. You know, what's the business process? How can we optimize this? How can we transform this? And I wasn't, I hadn't built sufficient rapport or relationship uh. with my directs, my direct reports. And then of course, with other people below them. And there were quite a few people there. And and then my, I remember my, my boss at the time um, pulled me aside and said, you know, it's not so much how you what you know or how much you know, rather. It's really more people want to know how much you care first. And, and so that lesson s- stayed with me the rest of my career is how much do I care about the people? Tell me about your family. Tell me about, you know, yourself. Let me understand a bit more uh, without crossing, you know, personal boundaries that people maybe don't want to go down in terms of whatever they want. You know, just to show some curiosity. And then, um, and then trying to build a rapport along cultural dimension. So try and throw in a few words here and then making fun of yourself and so forth. And then building a bit of rapport. And then, uh, then little by little, we found a way to, to bring in the efficiency of our go-to-market model or elevate the efficiency of it. But in a way that incorporated their local thinking, which was 10 times better than my thinking, and ended up becoming a transformation. And, and one big change was, you know, rather than having a truck, you know, have the same driver run around and sell everything from the back of a truck, we would split the, we would split the system and we'd have the salesmen run around on motorcycles and they would do a, a sale. And then the following day or two, the, the driver would come along, you know, would uh, deliver the products. And so that was a whole different go-to-market system that enabled us to reach many more retail outlets um, than previously we had done with the uh, traditional models. But, but it, took us, it took me that relationship building, and that was a lesson I learned. And there's many more. I mean, I have so many, <laughs> so many challenges. Oh, that was a golden nugget. I mean, that's <laughs> fantastic. Um, it's not what you know. It's show that you care yeah. first. Yeah, that's the secret. And yeah. that's really true for anywhere, really. But I think more so internationally because people are like, oh, you're from the U.S. and you think you know it all. Yeah. And we don't come with that mindset, but people can perceive that. Right, because we're jumping right into business. Right, we're right into business. And that's like... We're so used to that, the U.S. now. Get on yeah. a conference call, people are like, well, what's the agenda? Yes. Well, the other countries, we start to call first. How are things going? You know, what's going on with your local sports team? See, just to get a little banter going. And then we, you know, we dive into the agenda. 
Yes. And that is, it's so funny because that's so hard for me. I like to jump right in and get to it. But I can remember yeah. when I did my internship at Biogen between my first and second year at, yeah. <laughs> at Tuck, there was a manager that was really good. Like as people were gathering in, he got everybody involved in the conversation. He was very interested in what people had to say. The meeting just started with such a nice flavor and feeling that, you know, for years I've tried to incorporate it, but I have to consciously make myself think of it <laughs> absolutely absolutely yeah, yeah. so I mean, all right comes... go ahead go ahead no, go ahead i was gonna say that was a golden nugget and you said you have more <laughs> let's hear another mistake and what you learned from it oh i don't know um it's, it's, it's so many different you know we also it, it, we make most of our products locally uh as you would uh expect you know we manufacture produce snacks and beverages in a local market um, for freshness reasons and local flavor relevance. But occasionally we have customers who ask us to import items from the US. And uh, and so, you know, we've exported quite a few. We've exported, for example, Stacy's pita chips, uh, which is made in your backyard. Um, you know. Uh, and that's an exciting story because that was an entrepreneur that built Stacy. Yeah. Eating, yeah, it was a woman. It was, yeah, it was a very, it's probably, she's, she's actually a flag, it's a flagship for our woman entrepreneurship program and, you know, trying to support women in business. But we, we thought Stacy's would do well in Mexico without having done much consumer research. And, you know, we exported it via Sam's Club to Mexico and it didn't do as well as we expected. And so those are examples of just because something is popular at home, don't assume it's going to be popular in another country. And part of it is, of course, you have to, you know, you can't just, put, you can't just put something on a shelf. It's not going to work. And that's something to think about, the audience to think about as well is, you know, given that most people don't have big media budgets and so forth, how do you use PR? How do you use the power of, of social media, of digital marketing to make people aware, you know, what is a pita chip? You know, what is a bagel chip? It tends, it tends to be a very U.S. concept, at least bagel chip, for example, um, so, I mean, that type of export of just assuming that something is going to work in a new environment, I don't think, you know, is successful. I think you have to do the research, understand the whys and the insights. So did you get to the whys of Stacey's Pita Chips in Mexico? Because I heard you know, kind I think of it's, two things. One was the product and the other was the marketing. We never really got to the ultimate why, but one of the conclusions we got to was... It, the brand just didn't have enough awareness. And again, that was, that was, you know, that was something we should have done a better job on in terms of the social media or digital marketing. But I think ultimately the bite of the product might be too hard for that culture, a hard bite product potentially. Um, you know, PETA tends to be more, you know, from the Middle East, you know, that kind of a thing. So yeah. I, it's that, you know, in tortilla in Mexico is a big thing, but- yeah. You know, and, and again, then again, bagels is not a big thing in Mexico. No. So, you know, that tends to be a New York thing. And, you know, um, so we have bagel chips. I'm not sure I would export bagel chips because people might ask, what's a bagel? You know, right. <laughs> and coming from New York, I was like, what do you mean? What's a bagel? <laughs> so, right, right, right. Yeah, we have bagel everything. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So yeah. it's, I mean, those are things that you learn. But it's always grounded in you got to understand the consumer. You got, and if you sell in retail, you got to understand your customer. In other words, the customer who's buying your product, the retailer. And, and you got to understand the shopper. I mean, so if you think about it, you know, it's like a, a triangle or however you want to lay it out. But you got to understand, first of all, what does the consumer look for? Then, secondly, you know, what is the retailer looking for? in their category strategy and so forth. And then ultimately, you know, how do I get to the consumer? What is the shopper looking for? Well, let's say it's a shopper mom. You know, what is mom looking for, for her family? Um, and so that becomes quite interesting. Oh yeah, it's fascinating because you're adding so many different layers and then trying to get the product to them at the time that they want it, so. Yeah. 
And then, yeah. of course, supply chain is just supply chain is something that I've not naturally grown into or was born with in, in terms of a skill set. And that's one of the things I've really had to have learned in addition to digital marketing. Supply chain is so fundamental. And I would encourage all your listeners to really understand upstream supply chain. You know, what are the inputs into your into your products, even if you're co-packing something or co-manufacturing? And then what are the downstream logistical challenges? Because just getting stuff to a store shelf across borders is quite challenging, you know? So you learned how to do it. How did you go about learning it? Um, through deep immersion. I mean, some of it was, you know, a lot of reading. I was tried to, the way I approached learning something new is I tried to get a theoretical understanding. I actually took a tuck class in supply chain. I can't remember the professor's name, but he, he said, he since has left, he went to Wharton, but uh, it's on edX. I, by the way, I strongly recommend as, you know, to the audience members, go to edX.com, go to Coursera. You can learn anything. You can learn anything. And so on edX, there was a supply chain course. I took that as a foundation. Then I started getting into, um, uh, you know, rather than hand off to my supply chain um, team member, I would join his calls. And he'd be like, you know, you don't really have to join my calls. You're welcome to, but, you know, I, I said, I want to learn. And so I picked up a lot about supply chain and about the need to be, you know, obviously to, to be in stock on the shelf, otherwise you're going to disappoint shoppers and you're going to impact your sales. The need to have 100% order fill rate. If somebody orders 100 cases as a retailer, they want 100 cases. And of course they want it on time at a certain time. And all these things are incredibly difficult. So you need to make sure that, you know, as your audience members, if they work with importers and distributors, they have to make sure that those companies have strong logistical teams. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to know what questions to ask and, and, and dig into that. So that's, that, that I think is key. Yeah. And it's interesting. You work for a large company, so it, it, it wouldn't be applicable, but um, all the States have uh, offices of international commerce or export yeah. supports, and you can get grants to help pay for it. And you can get free yeah. advice all over the world to help yeah. set up a lot of this stuff. Absolutely. The states all have an interest to yes. boost their exports from the individual states in addition to Department of Commerce. Uh, so I think there's so much resource out there, but you know, it's still incumbent upon small enterprise, medium-sized enterprise to know enough themselves. Right. And uh, because ultimately it's their resources, it's their money, it's their capital on the line. Right. Right. But it's a good way to go and, and learn and find out what the, the options are. Does PepsiCo have any programs to support small and mid-sized businesses that want to export? Not that we, to export, but we do have a minority uh, business uh, procurement program. I don't have the exact name, but if your audience members have interest, they could email me after the call. But um, definitely in that space for sure. Okay. And okay. not only in terms of procurement, but we're also, we've announced some initiatives this year about investing in to uh, black owned, you know, enterprises, uh, especially in the food service space, black owned, Hispanic, minority owned enterprises in the food service space that were hit by the pandemic um, and trying to provide some forms of support there as well. So there's all kind, of, and PepsiCo is not unique in that space. I mean, there's a lot of companies that are thinking about this, and mm -hmm. so that's something that I would encourage. Another angle is to consider, for example, with Walmart. Walmart has a global footprint. I know because I work with them, and they will also help small, medium-sized enterprises reach their, you know, foreign store operations. They have a big retail footprint in Canada and Mexico. Central America, Chile, uh, South Africa, India, and China, those are big markets. And yeah. so um, I don't know the formal name of the program, but if they go on to walmart.com, they could fish around, they could find the name of the program. Um, and, um, you know, that's another avenue is to go through another business 
and not just retailers, but other businesses that have a global footprint that might be more into export. PepsiCo is not as much into export because obviously we make our products at a local level. But there's other companies, you know, I'm thinking of, let's say, Procter & Gamble. I mean, they make razor blades in a few places and then they export those things. Um, you know, there's different type companies that do different things. That's a great idea. I'll have to, I'll pass that on to some uh, businesses that I know that are in the, the um, you know, for the minority business procurement through PepsiCo, but then also Walmart. I hadn't looked into that area and it's at all. A, And like, let's take GM, for example, you know, people don't realize there's more cars sold in China today, I think, than the US. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I'm sure GM has a program to help, you know, small, medium size, you know, parts suppliers get into their global operational footprint. Um, so, I mean, that's another angle and probably a better angle for many companies. In other words, it's basically piggybacking a global right. company versus trying to replicate on your own. Yeah, yes, that's a fantastic idea. Um, so how about language? When you're traveling around to all these other places, how are you handling language? Um, I, I typically try to learn a little bit as I go, but a lot of people I speak to speak English, um, you know, because it is still lingua franca, you know, but, um, you know, I, 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 I can get by, I mean, obviously more in Europe mm -hmm. than Europe and Latin America, I'm fine. Right. Uh, outside of that, I tend to rely more on English, mm -hmm. the only way for me. Okay, you so know. business executives are speaking yeah. English. Yeah, primarily. Yeah. And then is is do you have any globalized marketing or are you all multinational? We have global brand teams that tend to look at like let's say Pepsi or Lay's at a global from a global perspective, but it, it's a federated system. I mean, because you, it's hard to come up with there's no more I mean, the old, day, old days, you'd have like Michael Jackson, global rock star and things like that. And then you'd have a campaign around Michael Jackson. Nowadays, music is much more fragmented and diverse. Hmm. And it's rare to find it, you know, a musical talent across all the borders. And so what you tend to see, uh, what we do in PepsiCo with music, for example, and Pepsi has a long heritage of music, as you know, is we tend to focus on local and regional stars, particularly emerging stars. Um, and you know, that resonates with our audience, with the people you're trying to bring into, into the business. Um, never put that together that Pepsi, but as I think through it, there's always a song that goes with it. Yeah. Michael Jackson, Madonna, you know, Britney Spears, Britney was probably the last of the kind of the big icon. I mean, we've had others, of course, at the local level, national level, but Certainly, Michael Jackson was probably the most global iconic and really the transformation of Pepsi into a really big musical, you know, the Alliance team music and Pepsi. Huh, that is so fascinating. So and then for you to talk about having a musical ear, is, it, is music kind of in the culture of Pepsi or? Music's in the culture of Pepsi, yeah. You know, we also have a focus on, on sports and um, we sponsor the Champions League which as you know, is the European, um, you know, uh, each of the cities in Europe have their own national teams, for example, yeah. Barcelona. For football, so, football, or otherwise football. known as soccer. Yes. Exactly. And uh -huh. so the Champions League is a big deal. And we just announced this year, this, we're sponsoring the Women's Champions League. So we believe women's soccer will continue to grow fast and probably be as big as other women's sports. For example, you know, uh, women's basketball or women's tennis or, uh, you know, it might take a few more years, but it's going to be a very big phenomenon as well. Right, right. Well, it certainly got huge in the U.S. and there's a yeah. lot of kids playing that. Playing yeah. It, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's really neat. I'll have to pay more attention to the to the music connection. I never kind of put it together. Um, and how do you handle like translation? Uh, the translate music, you mean, or no, just for the inner company communications or your website, or 
I mean, these things tend to be managed at a local level. Of course, our, our language internally is primarily English, um, but you know, the websites are all, you know, managed locally and all. You know, when you have a global company, you have people in each country who manage these things, and they they obviously put it into the proper language, um, which is important because you you just can't translate these words. You know, straight translation. Do you have global brand guidelines and messaging that they have to follow or do they all create their own in-language messaging? There are guardrails around how we want Lay's or Pepsi or other brands to be shown, but um, there's a lot of flexibility in the system. It's a federated system. And whether it's sales, marketing, you know, other things, you, there's no guardrails. I mean, I mean, there's no flexibility rather. I mean, when it comes to quality control, I mean, quality control is mandated. But when you're talking about things that are more locally relevant and adapted, you know, like sales and marketing, for example, that tends to have a strong, you know, local input. And by the way, it's a tension between global and local. Yeah, yeah. It's always a tension between global and local. You can centralize, but you're never going to have enough people to understand what's happening everywhere. Yeah. and make the right decisions. So you really got to have this dialogue or tension point, you know, and then you get that frontier between global and local. You're trying to always optimize what that is. Um, I think that's the right approach. Uh, I don't think centralizing 100% is the right way. I, I, I Definitely not. And I don't think at the other end, having this fragmented local approach, I don't think is right either because you can have everyone and it's a global world now. People are traveling around the world. Right. So if Pepsi is music in one place, it should be Pepsi music someplace else. Right. And the artist may change, but the, you know, the overall look and feel of it might be very similar. Right. Yeah, it's interesting. Another interview that I had was with um, Patrick Nunes from Rotary International. So, you know, another big global organization. And he talked about that global local connection and they were so localized that they had to bring some back global. So the, the journey they went through was very, very interesting. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so how about getting to know you a bit better before we run out of time? Um, what's your favorite foreign word? I always like to ask. Oh, my God. Um, it's a great question. You know, I think um, uh, the word jeitinho, je, I think it's J-E-T-I-N-H-O in Portuguese, Brazilian Portuguese. And I, when I was there, I said, you know, what does that really mean? And, you know, because we, we were behind plan or, oh, don't worry, this is Jeitinho. And there's a way, in other words, Jeitinho means there's a way. There's a way to get this done. There's an agile way. It's probably a good translation. There's an agile way of making this happen that you don't really understand because you're not from our culture. Oh, okay, I get it. And, and I, you know, initially I was skeptical. What do they mean by that? And then, and then I would see where we'd actually hit the objective, the one that we were struggling with. And they said, you see, the Jeitinho works. You have to, you know, you have to trust the process. I said, okay, <laughs> I'm never going to doubt that. <laughs> and, oh, that's a fabulous bi business word. Jeitinho. Yeah, Jeitinho I like a lot. Uh, so that's that's one I live by, especially nowadays, because you got to be so agile. It, and it takes a good salesperson. It says, ah, yeah, I'm a quarter of the way through. We're halfway through the month. Jatino. <laughs> Jatino, don't worry. It'll don't get worry, done. I'll get there. <laughs> It'll There's get a certain done. casualness in how they say it. But yeah. they're, they really are hardworking, driven, and, you know, they find a way. We would sell up until New Year's Eve. I mean, it was, we're just working to hit objectives, you know. Oh, that's good yeah. to know for hiring salespeople or growth experts and uh, so yeah. go for the, the hard, the Chetino crowd. <laughs> Chetino crowd, exactly. Uh -huh. And how about your favorite vacation? Um, yeah, that one's probably, that's easier probably. I would say that, you know, I think I have to go back to my roots. I have to say Barcelona. Um, oh. It's a fabulous city and Spain I love overall. But Barcelona, I think, is always near and dear to my heart, my, both my parents being from there. 
and uh, there's a certain connection. And then even independent of they're from there, the city is magnificent in terms of culture, food. You've got the beach right in the city itself. You've got nearby, you have two hours, three hours, you have skiing in the Pyrenees. Uh, you've got arguably the world's best uh, soccer team, Football Club <laughs> Barcelona. <laughs> Great business school, you know, um, just just fabulous people overall. And, yeah. uh, and of course, you know, you can't beat the nightlife. Dinner starts at 10. So those of you who go to bed early, do not go to Barcelona, <laughs> let alone Madrid, where it starts even later. But, you know, you just adjust your clock and that's it. Is <laughs> Barcelona. It the, yeah. What time does the workday start? It starts a bit later. People are flexible. I mean, they come in around 9, 9.30, 10. I mean, there's just a, just a rolling, you know, I think this old notion of, you know, kind of the midday siesta break that's kind of gone by the wayside they become yeah. more global in how they approach the day but still the the meal is quite late the meal right. is quite late especially on the weekends you know right right well i remember being in barcelona and there was some plaza you could go to where locals would gather at around five o'clock every day and do a dance yeah the sardana yeah the sardana, the sardana. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's a nice Nice. There's so many unique elements to that culture, and uh, I highly recommend everybody visit there at least once. And uh, certainly, all of Spain is beautiful. Um, and then there was a, back in Barcelona, there was the um, architect Gaudi that was there Gaudi, with the yeah. church. That's like the familiar. Park. Yeah. Yeah. And, and he's de he designed so many things. Park Güell, um, uh -huh. uh, which Park Güell originated as kind of an outdoor. It was meant to be a planned kind of sub community within the city itself. Um, and that didn't pan out, but it turned into a beautiful park and, and uh, they still have houses there you can visit and- Houses and apartment buildings. Yeah. And, I mean, it's really creative, neat work. Very inspirational. And, and even Sagrada Familia, how we did the church and oh, how yeah. we incorporated plant, plant structure, plants from nature into his design thinking which really yeah. was really quite brilliant. I mean, you're talking about 1920s, you know, 1910s and 20s. I mean, uh, and it's still not finished. I, I was going to ask. Uh, well, I was there years ago and I didn't think it was finished yet. No, it's still not finished. It's just a long-term project. And I, you know, they have this spirit of, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day and neither was Sagrada Familia. So yeah, yeah. Well, it's spectacular now. It's definitely worth a visit to. Um, and how about what are your, most crazy cross-cultural experiences, you know, at work. It was funny because in Brazil one time, I remember uh, I went to my uh, colleague invited us for dinner and he said, I said, okay, great. What time? He said, uh, eight o'clock. I said, fine. I go to the house at eight o'clock, eight, 10, be fashionably late. <laughs> and <laughs> I ring the doorbell and my, my colleague comes to the door. He's like in his robe. I was like, I mean, am I too early? He said, well, yeah, because nine, nine, people start arriving 9, 9.30 in Brazil. I said, okay. <laughs> I, thought, I thought being 10 minutes late was fashionable. And he was like, no, in Brazil, it's, it's like an hour. You, you're not going to be. <laughs> so my wife and I had to get down to the corner. We got the beer and then we came 30. And uh, that was funny. That was funny. <laughs> That's hysterical. Yeah, because you hear about time is fluid. So yeah, an hour and a half late. <laughs> time is fluid. You know, and, and that's less so in like daily business calls. But you know, you have to allow five or ten minutes. You know, if people things run over, and you know, the, whenever I get on a U.S. call, it's like people were there two minutes before, and right at the hour, the kickoff goes. That just does not happen in uh, our global Zoom calls. I mean, people come in five, 10 minutes late. So the first five, 10 minutes is kind of chit chat. And then once you get to a, you know, to a target group size, then you kick off. But, you know, uh, it's that always whole a building reports that absolutely. time to do that. Right. Absolutely. And how about any final uh, recommendations you might have for people that are exporting if they want to, to grow? I, you know, I think um, 
I, Google, I think, is probably the number one thing. I mean, I would certainly begin to look at, you know, doing research, whatever in, industry you're in, Google whatever your brand or your product or your category, and then put the country name in and see what comes up. It's like the most unbelievably efficient way to do research on anything. Um, and and then, um, and then you can follow up from there. You're going to see links. That's another good thing. Once you go into the articles, you're going to see backlinks. And you can begin to explore and then do research that way. Um, you know, then, uh, you know, look at the Department of Commerce has maintains, you know, qualified importers and distributors and their databases. I'm sure the states have this as well. And, you know, each state has a different industry footprint, so they might know more even than the Department of Commerce mm -hmm. in certain, uh, for example, in South Carolina is a big, you know, furniture state, you know, or Michigan's a big car state or whatever it might be. So the state export teams might know more. Um, and then having a conversation with those people, reaching out to those importers, uh, going on government trade fairs, obviously, is a big way to do things. Um, but, you know, the, you have to think, you know, there's, what, seven plus billion people in the world. And the U.S. is only, what, 330 or something <laughs> million people. So, I mean, we're not even 10 percent of the population. Right. And certainly we have a big economic footprint. But if you're thinking about the long term nature of your business, I mean, so many companies, including PepsiCo. Uh, you would think PepsiCo has been around for, what, 50, 60 years now. I mean, as a PepsiCo company. Uh, but we still have tremendous growth opportunities mm. in, in Lay's and in Quaker and Gatorade. I mean, that can go on forever. And so if we have opportunities, I mean, just think about, you know, a small midsize enterprise. Mm -hmm. And I would also tie and focus on, you know, one or two geographies at a time. Yes, that's excellent advice. Like, don't go too wild and try to ca capture the whole world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and where can people reach you? Um, they can reach me at uh, John J O H N dot Jove J O V E at PepsiCo dot com. And you can also find me on LinkedIn. I think under the same John. Under LinkedIn, it's actually John Charles Jove. Uh, I use LinkedIn quite a bit. I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. Oh, good. Oh, good. Okay. So John Jove. John Charles Jove at, at LinkedIn. Yeah. Okay. J-O-V-E. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. It's been such a joy having you here. Thank you, Wendy. I really appreciate it. And I just, I want to also just recognize your, you know, great book that you wrote. I think it was really an outstanding contribution to global marketing and sales and very innovative in how you thought about. It. And I think the things you're doing are more relevant than ever in a digital world. And, you know, it's, it's, and people have to be very attentive to how they communicate on digital. Um, so anyway, that's, that was a great uh, contribution to uh, US export, US global thinking. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, I appreciate you mentioning it. You know, if anybody's interested, it's called The Language of Global Marketing. You can find it on Amazon. There is an ebook, a hard copy, and a um, audio that we're just releasing this month. So it's Oh, it's the Audible. I have to get the Audible version. I'm going to get yeah. that one as well. <laughs> <laughs> You can listen to it while you're walking. I, it's recorded in my voice down in a wine cellar that I use for storage. And I had a audio technician come in and coach me how to do it. So I had, a, I had fun doing it. <laughs> That's fabulous. A great read. So, well, thank you again. Thank you. And great speaking with you. All right. Well, thank you. And thank you, listeners, for tuning into the Global Marketing Show. Um, I hope that you share this episode with at least one person who does some global marketing because there's a ton of good information in here. Uh, and if you have any questions or ever want to talk global marketing, certainly feel free to reach out to me. Either one of us you can find on LinkedIn. We're both very active on there. John Charles Jove and uh, Wendy Pease. Um, he's at PepsiCo and I'm at Rapport International. So uh, tune back in. We release an episode every week.
Thank you. That's a wrap for this session. A big thanks to you for listening to the Global Marketing Show. Hope you had just as much fun as I did. New sessions launch weekly on all places you find podcasts, Apple, Spotify, Google Play, and of course on our website. If you know someone interested in this topic, please tell them about us. Au revoir for now.